Anytime I'm giving a lecture to students, one of the things that I'm always kind of afraid of, and I think everyone should be, is that students, if they go on to a long programming career, will be programming for like 40 years. And I've already been programming for 40 years, and I know that any kind of advice or information or things that people say are true 40 years ago often aren't true even a few years after, let alone for all your entire programming career. So for this lecture, I kind of wanted to try and figure out, is there anything that I could say about software architecture, which is primarily what I work on day to day and what I think most about? Is there anything I could say that I've ever seen that approximates an actual like law, like something I don't think will ever break, so that if you learn to think about it and apply it every day in how you view software architecture and architecture in general, that you'll never really have to update it. Maybe you'll refine it, but you'll never really have to update it. So first I want to try and tell you what is a law? Like what do I actually consider a law to be? And we can look to other domains and figure this out really quickly. We all know what a law is in physics. Here, for example, is Newton's law of gravitation. And this law is very simple. It just says that the force acting between two bodies, right, is going to be uh, proportional to some constant times the masses divided by the radius squared between them, right, the distance squared between them. And this was very revolutionary, I'm sure at the time it was presented, but it lasted for 100 years or some odd till today. And we still use it if you wanted to do gravity simulation today in a program in like terrestrial body mechanics, you would still use this until you got to like entire solar systems or something like that, right? So this law did get replaced, eventually it got replaced by Einstein's theory of relativity, which I've never typed into a program. I have used the old one, um, Newton's, Newton's law. I've never used Einstein's sort of updated law. And so to me, that is really what the definition of a law is. It's something that we're so sure about, like Newton's law of gravitation, that we've proven out so well that even when it turns out to be wrong, it's not really wrong, it's more like not quite complete. And we're sort of making some more subtle, more nuanced version that lets us capture more things. We don't even have to stop using the old one because it really does still work in all the places. It wasn't a lie for all the things we were using it for. It still works. It's just now we want to go beyond we, you know, make a refinement. So the question is, does software have anything like this, right? Software is very new. Uh, physics has been around for much longer, so you'd expect them to have laws by now, hopefully, right? But, but what about software? I would say that, you know, it's too early for us to say, but there are things that do look like they might turn out to be laws. For example, this is Amdahl's law. It's actually called a law, Amdahl's law, but in software people call everything a law, so that's not really much of an indication. There's no criteria for being called a law, but it does happen to be, it's Amdahl's law. And this is a very interesting observation about parallelizing programs. What it says is the time, execution time, like how long you expect something to run, the time for something using n parallel workers, so like n threads, for example, is going to be equal to, has to be equal to, the amount of time it takes to run the part that cannot be parallelized. So the part that simply cannot be broken up into multiple work uh, pieces that can be done simultaneously. The part that cannot be parallelized plus whatever's left over, so the time it takes to do the thing single threaded minus the part that cannot be parallelized divided by the number of threads. Now, you don't have to understand this for the lecture, so you know I'm not going to go into, into too much detail, but it's a fairly simple equation, and it's fairly straightforward. If you went and looked at it for 10 minutes, you'd totally get it. And if you graph what this means, you can look this up anywhere. I grabbed this chart from Wikipedia, just a well-known result. As you start to increase the number of threads, so as you increase the number of computing components working on a task, Amdahl's law tells you that the amount of time it takes to execute that task rapidly approaches and then can never exceed 
the amount of time it takes to execute the single threaded part. Why? Because that part doesn't get faster by adding more threads. And here you can see a couple lines. One is for if it's a perfectly paraly paralyzable problem, basically if 95% of it's paralyzable, versus if like very much smaller amounts are paralyzed, you can see where you end up asymptotically on your speed up, right? And so you can see why this happens. It's very uh, simple. As the number of threads or parallel workers goes to infinity, this term just drops out because the n becomes extremely large, so it just isn't there. So really, it's just the non-parallelizable part that dominates the runtime. So as you get more and more and more and more cores in a computer or more and more cores in a GPU or whatever it is, you expect the single-threaded part to become dominant because it will never speed up, no matter what we do. But of course, that's not really about software architecture. I mean, it does tell you something about optimization and it might inform your choices of software architecture. It is sort of something I think everyone should know and I do think it's good to learn. Will it stand the test of time? Who knows? I mean, we'll probably get more subtle versions of it. People already are sort of thinking about communication in there more. There's, there's other things you would probably add to it, but it's a very good thing to know and it does seem kind of like a law because we know you'll never be able to exceed that asymptote no matter what you do. That's just math. But does architecture have any laws like that, right? That doesn't really tell us anything about the structure of the program beyond the fact that here's the speeds it will end up running at if you broke it into this many pieces, but that's really all it tells us. So there are things going around masquerading as laws, but they're really not laws. Some of them are called laws, some of them aren't. There's things like the, you know, if you Googled software architecture law, which I did just to see what people might call a law, you'll get things like the Pareto principle, which is also called the 80-20 rule. It's like, you know, it comes in various forms. 80% of the time is spent in 20% of the program or other things like that. There's all kinds of versions of it. But it's not a law. It doesn't really tell us anything. It's also just kind of not true. I mean, sometimes it happens, sometimes it's not. It's more of like a vague, this this tends to happen kind of a thing um, that, you know, it, like, like maybe, uh, but, you know, not, it, it's not even really actionable in all that many ways. So it's, it's not really a law. Um, you have things like solid, which you'll get taught, which are like this list of rules of thumb for object oriented programming or something. But again, it's not a law. It doesn't tell you anything about software architecture other than some things someone thought was a good idea. Most of which I don't even think are good ideas. So it's definitely not a law. It doesn't, there, there's no, there's nothing in here that like causes an actual, you know, real uh, emergent property of software to be told, right? Like a law would. There's things like Postel's law, which is now something called a law, but it's not a law. It's just, again, a rule of thumb. It says something like uh, you should be lenient in what you accept and stringent in what you output. Again, not a law. And then there's Brooks' law, which actually is a software law, but again, it's still not quite architecture, but I do want to mention it because much like Amdahl's law, it's sort of a little bit related to what we're talking about here, and it is something that appears to actually be true. So I'm quickly going to say this before I go on to the actual law I want to talk about. Brooks' law is an observation by Fred Brooks, uh, wrote The Mythical Man Month a long time ago. It was sort of the first book that said all these management practices are based on this concept called the man month, which imagines that a human being is just something that you throw at a problem and it gets faster. So, you know, if we have something we're trying to make, throwing more people at making it just makes it faster. And what Brooks tried to argue in this book was based on a lot of management experience and what the industry had been going through at the time. He basically tried to argue that, look, when tasks are complicated and they involve intercommunication, you end up not being able to do that. He, these are graphs that I grabbed from the actual book. I happen to own this book and I scanned it. The first graph is what it looks like when you add people to a project and there's no communication necessary. So it's like they're just doing something on an assembly line. They don't need to talk to each other. They just do it. That looks a lot uh, like what you expect, right? It just keeps getting better as you go, but, you know, each person you add, you know, the first person you add, if you only have one person working on something, doubles the time. The next one won't, right? So you have a natural sort of power fall off there. Uh, the next graph is what happens if there's no ability to parallelize things. If the things have to be done sequentially and they're, you're only building one of them, for example, then adding people to a project doesn't do anything. They're just sitting around doing nothing right? Uh, because one person has to finish all the stuff they were doing and hand it to the next person before the work can proceed. So you don't expect any speed up in that kind of a case. Um, the asymptotic case, which is the one on the right, 
is the one where it says, look, you can make things faster by adding people, but there's a communication barrier. Those people have to talk to each other in these complex tasks. So rather than it continuing to go towards zero, it's going to go towards something higher than zero. That's whatever the natural communication cost is to coordinate this task. They're never going to get beyond that. Not until we have hive mind technology from you know Elon Musk implants in our heads or something like this, right? And then finally, he showed a graph that was like the worst case is when the communication cost actually can just increase past the efficiency point. So if we add people to a project and our communication isn't efficient, it will actually start costing more than it did originally as we add people, right? Now, if you take a look at the asymptotic one, where it's like assuming we got our communication worked out as well as we could, we assume there's a natural barrier where even if we're as optimal with communication as we can be, we're going to hit some natural floor. If you just imagined like turning that around and comparing it to Amdahl's law, you're really kind of looking at roughly the same statement. These are statements about how fast you can make something with parallel workers and recognizing that there's a fundamental stumbling block in Amdahl's law's case, it's the part that cannot be parallelized, the part that has to be sequential. And in Brooks's law case, it is the part that it requires coordination between workers, which makes it so that adding more does not get you as much as you would have expected, right? Now, we're getting close because that sort of is about architecture, but it's not quite architecture yet. So that brings us to the paper I actually want to talk about, talk about, which is how do committees invent? This is a paper from 1968 in a magazine called Datamation. It was published in this magazine, which, by the way, still exists, um, which, is, which is odd. It doesn't exist in print anymore, but it exists online. Datamation is uh, a magazine where this was printed because the Harvard Business Review or something like this wouldn't print it because they didn't think it proved its conclusion strenu strenuously enough or something like that, which is kind of amusing to me because this is probably one of the best papers on architecture I've ever read, uh, bar none. So it's, I guess, fitting in my opinion of Harvard Business Review that it didn't publish it. So it was published uh, by a fellow named Melvin Conway. Um, he was from Caltech, and he was actually working at Sperry Rand uh, on the UNIVAC uh, at the time, on Rand's UNIVAC division. Okay, so let me give you a quick overview of what this paper says, and then we'll kind of go into why I think it's important. So this paper is very accessible. I highly recommend that anyone who's interested in this after hearing the lecture go read it. It is not a paper that requires a lot of technical acumen to understand. It's, it's broad, it's intuitive, uh, and it's very well written. So it's other than the fact that it's kind of a little old timey because it was 1968. So, you know, the, the prose is a little more like sophisticated than it would be today, let's say. Um, other than that, it's very easy to understand what's being said. What this paper says is there used to be, you know, inventors and they would just invent things, right? Because the things they were inventing were pretty simple. They could be invented and designed by one person or two people, five people. They could just be in a room doing stuff and then you got whatever came out the other end and it was fine, right? But as we want to do things that are more complicated, like the you know, Apollo moon landing, these huge projects, or even things that are less impressive, like just a basic computer, uh, still requires tons of people to work on these projects because they're that ambitious now, and there's things that no one person can really hope to accomplish by themselves. So in order to actually do the task of design, of invention, you must first do things before you start really. And what the paper points out is before you even really get going, somebody has to decide two things. One, what is it that we're actually making? Meaning it can't really be very open-ended. We have to first kind of circumscribe what we might be trying to make and give it some kind of a, at least vague definition. And then we have to decide what the structure is of the organization that will pursue that design, right? In other words, we're going to need some way of, we, we need a company, right? We need, we need people in positions or a collection of companies or a consortium or committees or something 
if we want to bring more than 20, 30, 40 people to bear on this task, we have to start breaking them into groups. And at the outset, someone's going to have to decide that or some small group of people have to decide that. The paper then goes on to say, well, if you're going to break things up, right? If you're going to have enough people that you have to start making teams that are going to focus on particular topics, you've created a coordination problem, right? You now have to have those teams talk to each other. They need to know what each other are doing and they need to be able to work with each other. And that's an actual problem in and of itself, separate from the act of inventing or designing whatever it is that they're making. And here begins the very crucial and what I think are profound insights from this paper. Melvin Conway then tells us, once you have chosen some aspects of the design and you decide to delegate duties to it, right? Like you create an org chart or something, this team's going to do something, and maybe that team actually needs sub teams to coordinate, right? Once you start having a structure, an actual human structure to the design, Every time you make a new piece, a new breakdown of that organization, you are presupposing that certain designs are not necessary. You may not be doing this knowingly, but just the act of drawing a dividing line between two teams means that you're saying that the design of the thing you're making doesn't really need to have a high bandwidth communication on between those two areas, right? Like the tires of the car and the engine of the car are gonna be designed by different teams. So we're presupposing that the engine and the tire cannot be one piece, right? And sometimes that's a perfectly reasonable thing, but other times it may be lopping off parts of the design space that actually were where the best thing was, right? So, this leads to what I think is a really great conclusion, probably the most important part of the paper, although it's not the one it's remembered most for. And that is that given any design team, like this is the organization of the team, you can already say that there are certain designs it cannot produce because it is unable to do the communication that would be necessary at the frequency that it would need to do so to produce that design. Now, uh, if you take this a little bit further, and Conway does in the paper, what he basically says is that sets up a sort of homomorphism. If we look at the org chart for an organization and we look at the structure of the products that it produces, we would expect them to basically just be collapses of each other. Meaning, if I took one graph and the other graph, I should be able to do some small node collapses or expansions on one or the other and get the same graph back. There's going to be basically the same structure between the two of them, and we're not going to expect to see much difference. Okay, so what this tells us is that we would expect to see, right, organizations only able to succeed at designing things that look like themselves, and furthermore, that if an organization cannot itself change its org chart, meaning to the extent that it is difficult in an organization to change how teams are organized, or if you do so only very infrequently, or if there's a lot of rules about who can talk to who, et cetera, et cetera, you will calve off more and more and more of the possible designs that you could have to the point where a completely static org chart, one that cannot change, one that has very defined lines of communication, for example, and that doesn't change over time, basically he comes to the conclusion that it will just produce a copy of itself. Every product that comes out of that org will just look like the org, right? So that's Conway's Law. Conway's law, as pithily stated, is that companies, organizations, teams, at any level of detail, they produce things that have the same structure as they do, right? It's not so much that we're creating a piece of software as we are creating a copy of ourselves in software, right? With the same kind of diagrammatical structure. So to 
put this a little bit more visual. Uh, for those of you who've never had any experience with Conway's Law before, which is probably a lot of people because it doesn't get talked about that often, so not many people have really thought that much about it, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully that will change because I think it's very important. But if you imagine us sitting down, we're going to design something. First, we have to decide what we're going to design. All right, maybe we decide we're going to design an operating system. And then we start to come up with the things that it needs. Oh, it's going to have to have like internet and it's going to have to have this and that. And like one of the things we decide it's going to need is media. Like it needs to play back media. It has to have like audio visuals, right? So we decide there's going to be like a, a delegation from, you know, the, the main, you know, our main company. There's going to be a team in there or, a, or a, probably an org, a whole sub org devoted to figuring out how this thing is going to play media and writing that. Well, probably because we're hiring people, we're going to hire like audio people for audio and video people for video. We probably end up structuring the team as there's an audio team and a video team, right? And they're both underneath the media umbrella. The audio team might be like split up into like playing music versus playing sound because some of those have different, uh, you know, uh, aspects to them or whatever. Uh, and then the video team might be like split into 2D and 3D, let's say. This is, this is just to give you a very simple example of like very basic. Any org chart today, like at a company, um, like Google or something, is vastly more complicated than this. So this is like very simple, because just to give you a flavor of it, right? If we were to sit down and do this, what would we expect to see as a product at the end of the day? It would not be something that's just arbitrary. We wouldn't expect to have, I don't know, there'll be some API for playing media. I don't know what it will be. Or it'll just be an operating system that happens to be able to play media. No. What we expect to see is this. Direct music, direct sound, direct draw, direct 3D, right? We expect to see one API for each of these things because that is how we structured our teams. We decided ahead of time that that's what we were going to do. And so the product has that structure. And by the way, this is exactly the structure that Windows had when they sat down to do this, right? Now, furthermore, they also ended up with other parts of the org chart exposed. We not only know as end users who were not privy to the design process, we not only know about the fact that there was this direct blah in here, but the direct X org, like the whole system that works on that, also kind of gave itself a brand and has its own like SDK that they ship, right? So the, the whole org chart actually starts to be exposed and we can see it in the end product. Now, there's an additional wrinkle here that I want to talk about a little bit later, so I'm just going to you know, put it in there so that I can come back to it. And that is, if you look at what ends up happening, nowadays, these are a little bit different. Direct music went away. It's not still there. You can still redistribute if you wanted to use it or something, but it's not like actively pushed, and the org doesn't exist inside Microsoft anymore. It went away in both the product and the company, right? There's X audio now instead of direct uh, instead of direct audio, right? That the they they've added new ones. The old ones are still in the product, but there isn't like a team working on direct direct sound. Sorry, um, I meant direct sound, not direct audio. Sorry, it's right in the slide. I said it wrong. Uh, X audio, direct uh, draw is now direct two D, but it's a completely different API, right? So direct draw is still in there, but direct two D is there now as a different API, and Direct 3D is still around. That one has, has maintained the whole time. So again, don't need to think about that part right now, but we're going to come back to it. So please remember that you know when you first create one of these things in software, that's not the end of the story. OK. So what I want to try and get across here is that what Conway's law tells us, if it does turn out to be true, is that the org chart is the asymptote, right? At the end of the day, the best you can do is put out a product that looks roughly like the org chart. Now, it's an asymptote. It's the best you can do. The worst you can do is actually something much more uh, you know, granular, like something where we have lots of different APIs or things for one purpose because a team that didn't really have to didn't do a very good job, so they make too much complexity in their area and don't do a good job on their design, let's say. So it's an asymptote. It's the best we can do. It's not necessarily what we'll get because maybe the people weren't very good or maybe it's our first time around or whatever. Who knows? But it's the best we can expect to do. Now, if it's an asymptote, to me, it fits nicely in here, right? We had Brooks' law. We had Amdahl's law. And now we also have Conway's law. And they're all talking about asymptotes in what we can aspire to do in programming. Brooks' law tells us the asymptote for like getting a project done, right? 
It's about the inter-team communication. It tells us what we can expect from our schedule. Omdahl's law tells us what we can expect for when the thing runs, because it's just going to tell us no matter how fast computers get, there's going to be this natural asymptote based on what we see in the unparallelizable part of our program, the longest single dependency chain, if you will. And then we have Conway, which tells us at the limit, if we do the best we possibly can, what will the software architecture of our product look like? And the answer is it will look like the teams and communication structures that built it. Now, I want to emphasize that the why in Conway's law is way more important than the what, because the why can be applied all over the place. So just remembering the pithy saying of org charts produce copies of themselves doesn't really give you the full insight. And so what I want to do is just emphasize, I'd just like to re make it really clear uh, for anyone who uh, wants to sort of get this into their brain as a fundamental tool that what we're talking about is not org charts necessarily cloning themselves. That's the result, but the mechanism for that has to be understood. The mechanism is that communication between teams is more costly than communication inside teams. Or if you want to go to the limit, a single person typing in code communicates with themselves basically infinitely fast. I always know what I am thinking, right? So one person, has complete latitude to think their way through a problem any way they want to. As soon as I split that problem into work that two people have to do, there now has to be some communication between them. Either they agree on an interface, or they communicate daily or weekly or monthly to update how their code will work with each other, right? Or they don't communicate at all, which means that their code cannot co-evolve, meaning the boundary between them will remain fixed at all times because there's no way they can even talk to each other and uh, you know, have some kind of a way of agreeing on what to do next. Um, and again, communication in this case doesn't mean literally talking. It could mean that I check in something to a source tree that you have to check out, right? And that always costs way more than if I were just doing it because you don't know what I was thinking. You don't know why I did these changes. You don't even know if they're good or whatever, right? You have to validate that or come to an understanding or ask me. So no matter what ends up happening, the higher the cost of communication, the less iteration will happen there. So what you end up with, the reason that org charts seem to replicate themselves is not because of that literal concept that org charts replicate themselves. It's because inside any given organizational box, communication is faster and therefore design iteration can happen more quickly than if it has to go across boxes where the cost is increased. So it's really about creating nested domains of optimization where each level you go down, the design can be optimized more fluidly and more quickly and each level up you go, each time you try to go further, like, for example, if I needed this team here to talk to that team there, they have to go, like, all the way up and over here if there isn't a way for those two teams to meet directly, for example, right? The further the, the path is between two things, the less we would expect them to be able to explore shared design, where solutions to their problems actually come from doing work together, Right? So Conway's law is not only about org charts. It's actually just about this fundamental concept that there are high cost and low cost areas, and the low cost areas will get optimized eventually if you have good people, but the high cost areas cannot be. They just can't be. So what I'd like to do finally is take a look at where we've gotten to now today. If you believe anything that I just said about Conway's law, or maybe I should say if you believe Conway's paper, and I highly recommend everyone read it. I don't think we can call it a law yet because we don't have lots of ways of proving things in the software world, and we don't really know how to come to that kind of consensus. So it's called Conway's Law. I kind of think it probably is sort of a law, but it's not the law like law of gravitation, but it's the only thing I could think of that might someday be. And furthermore, I would say I can already sort of see that there's also probably an Einsteinian refinement to it, right? There's probably going to be, if we can really confirm Conway's law as some kind of actual fundamental property, that we would then also see that there's a refinement to it that actually carries extra nuance. 
So that's what I want to talk about now. I call this section Conway's Nightmare because I wanted to call the talk that, but unfortunately, Melvin Conway is not the Conway people think about. They usually think about John Conway, so I thought if I called the talk Conway's Nightmare, people would come, thinking that it was going to be a lecture on John Conway, which is not, and I didn't want to be misleading, so I figured mysterious title is better than misleading title, and I went with the only one, Unbreakable Law. If you would like to mentally retitle this Conway's Nightmare, please do. Okay. It's not that Conway didn't know about software architecture. He did. So I'm not trying to say that Conway didn't already think about these things. I'm just pretty sure that he didn't quite foresee where things would go because he was writing this in 1968 when software and software creation organizations were much simpler and smaller than they are today. Conway definitely knew about software. He gives an example in the paper of uh, assigning five people to write a compiler and getting back a five-pass compiler, right? Um, which is kind of funny, but, you know, is exactly kind of what you would expect, right? He also gives an example of an operating system being broken down into the same parts as the orgs that actually uh, designed it right and things like this. So he was thinking about computers and software for sure when he wrote the paper. But I don't think he was thinking about anything like this, right? Nowadays, some of the most important and foundational software that we use every day, like Unix or something or Windows, uh, you know, their lifespans are massive. The original code branch of Windows is 1985 to 2000, right? That got merged together to produce, like with the Windows NT code branch was started in 93. These kind of merged together and are still running today in 2022, right? So we have something that started at least part of it in 1985 and that's running until 2022 and beyond. There's no sign that anyone's going to stop running Windows next year, right? So that's four decades of a code base being in use. There are some ideas, probably, from the original version of Windows, some small pieces of that design concept space are probably still present today. Certainly all the ones from Windows 95 era are there still today, right? Uh, the entire UI basis, if you actually look at the programming model, looks like that, right? It's maybe slowly getting replaced over the years, but it's still all there and tons of things use it, et cetera, et cetera. So four decades, 40 years, right, of code base. And so what I think Conway didn't foresee because I don't know how he could have. But what Conway, I don't think, foresaw is he was thinking that there would be like a company org chart that's going to make a product. And they make the product, and it looks like the org chart, right? So company makes product. They look like each other. And then if you change the org chart to something somewhat different, you made some changes, the next time you make a product, it will then look like that org chart. I think that's what Conway had in his head when he was thinking about this paper, right? We change the org chart, we change the product. What I don't think he foresaw is that these products, because software is so easy to leave around nowadays, legacy code bases are not just common, they're like the rule. When you do your next product, it's more like the previous product also carries forward, right? So new products not only have the org chart from the old team and the new team, like, in, in them, they merge, right? So a product you produce today will effectively have something in it from, like, every org chart your company ever had will be in your current design. At least that's what it appears to be doing as far as I can see right? And the only time this stops happening is if you do a clean wipe. If you say we're getting rid of all of this code and we're starting over or something like that, right? It says if you became a new product or a new org. And that's what I think Conway was thinking of. I don't think he was thinking that things would end up mostly being like this. He probably would have thought of this as like a rarer case, but now it's the norm. So what that means is those delegations, those breaking things down and introducing barriers because you have to for communication, now includes time travel. We're not just talking about one org chart. We're talking about all of the superpositions of all of the org charts that existed in time. Much like an Einsteinian modification to Newton's law of gravitation, time is on the table now, right? And just to give you some example, if you don't believe me, um, I, I have my operating system org chart before. 
let's you know say we're doing Microsoft Windows. It has that audio team somewhere in there, and you know that's the kernel audio team. I that 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 was just the DirectX one that I drew, but really the org chart for Windows is way more complicated because there's audio driver teams like the kernel audio, which is different than the DirectX audio team. It, like it's there's a whole situation, right? But Let's assume we're just talking about we want a volume control on, in our audio, right? So we have some audio organization. Who knows how complicated it is? Probably very if it's Microsoft or something. And just somebody gets assigned the task or even a team gets assigned the task of please be able to control the volume of the, like, the speakers, right? I just, I, I just need the volume of the speakers. I, I want to be able to turn this volume up and down. So what we would expect, based on Conway's law, as an asymptote, if everyone's doing their job, is there'd be a volume slider somewhere. And maybe for usability purposes, that volume slider could pop up in multiple places, but we would expect it to probably be all the same volume slider because the person would figure out, okay, what's the best way to display volume? And they would just display the volume that way, and you, the user would learn to use it once, and then they would always use the volume slider and understand it, and it would be predictable, and they would, they would know it by sight, and all those great things, and they would have a clear understanding that it was the same volume slider, all of these things, should be relatively easy to accomplish. It's one slider for one value, right? But what we actually see if we open up Windows, this is on my personal machine. I just screenshotted all the volume controls that are on the base install of Windows. This is how many you have. There's actually five. So you don't just have one volume slider, you actually have five volume sliders, and they're not just five copies of the same slider that are popped up for convenience, they're actually all like completely different. Some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical, some of them include a picker for whether or not you're gonna change the output, some of them don't, some of them have additional settings buttons or other things like that, some of them have a mute button, you know, all these, th there's, there's all of these different things that might be involved or might not be involved depending on the circumstance. Right, And if you take a look at where all these come from, what's interesting to see is that none of them come from the same version of Windows, basically. Some of this comes from like the original control panel. Some of this comes from Windows 7 adding a more sophisticated mixer dropdown. I believe it was Windows 7. It could have been XP or Vista. I, I, to be honest, I, I don't really have enough version of Windows to check. But... Then there was Windows 8, which added a modern settings experience, as they call it. It's definitely an experience. Um, Windows 8 added a modern settings thing, and that has its own kind of different style in there. Um, and then in Windows 8, it, they didn't actually replace the dropdown in the sys tray uh, with one that looked like it. So it actually used to look more like this one when the, the dropdown in the sys tray, the, the mixer from Win 7 is what you used to actually see. But then in Windows 10, they changed it to look more like the modern settings, right? So now when you run Windows 10, what you will see is four volume sliders from Windows and one that is actually predicted by Conway's law directly. Now, first let's talk about the Conway's law predicted one. So we need no modification to Conway's law to realize that I made an error when I originally said, well, we have an audio team and we delegate to having a volume control, so we would expect to have one volume control. Wrong. I forgot to say, well, I mean, I didn't forget because I made the slides. I pretended to forget to say that we know there'll also be people shipping the sound hardware. And the way that we chose to set up our operating system way back when in Windows is that the people who install the hardware can also install their own software. And obviously, if you have an org chart that has an audio team on one company, Microsoft, and an audio team at another company, which is the people who supply the sound card, they're both going to delegate volume control to somebody, and those two teams are never going to talk to each other, so we're going to have at least two volume control in Windows, always, for all of time, there will at least be two volume controls until they change this idea, right? And lo and behold, that's exactly what we always see in Windows, at least. There's always the Windows volume controls that they ship, and then every IHV, Realtek, uh, you know, whoever it is that you have for your sounding machine ships their own thing, which has its own volume control, always, right? So that's just, that's just going to happen. Conway tells us that will happen, and he's always right in this case, right? But let's just focus on the Windows part. Why are there four of these in the Windows part when Conway might have said there'd only be one, right? Because it's just one delegation to, to one person or one team. Well, the reason is because of that temporal, right, delegation. 
People write stuff in the original version of Windows or, you know, Windows 95 or something like this, whatever the last time was that they did a wipe of that area and did a clean rewrite. When they did that, they introduced like this control panel, which had a volume slider for, you know, the particular piece of, you know, the, the software that the, had a volume slider for that particular output or whatever it was in the control panel. And later they decided, well, a pop-up mixer would be better. So at some point they add the mixer and that mixer also has a drop down in the sysTray, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a quick version. That's a, a simple version of itself, right? Then it, later they add the modern settings panel, which is a completely different thing. And again, they don't replace any of this. And then finally they decide, well, we're going to replace just the drop down. So this old drop down is not going to be there anymore, but they didn't bother to replace the mixer. So it's still there, right? So if we look at the different pieces of, you know, this software stack, if you will, when they got added and who was touching what when, you can see that we actually have different pieces of the software being done at different times. There was the original programming org that was involved in doing this part. There was the Win7 org, then the Win8 org, the Win10 org. And Part of it is no longer visible, right? The Win8 part is not visible anymore because Win10 kind of unified that whole thing, right? So we now are kind of seeing the Win10 result, the Win7 result, and the original result. We're seeing at least three results, right? Um, and when the user looks back at it, they will see at least that many. Now, in the original, I was like, well, you kind of see this part that got introduced in Win 8, but it's sort of unified with the Win 10 part, so that's why I didn't include it here. So I'm giving them the best case. The best case is you could say, well, it was, it's Win 10 control, so it was reduced in Win 8, but they're the same, right? So the Win 10 control is basically the same. We'll give them that. But the Win 7 control is clearly different, and the original control is also clearly different, right? So what we come to is that this org chart is not really the org chart that produced the software that we're talking about. Because this part of the org chart here, this volume, where we delegated the audio team, delegated someone to write the volume, they actually delegated only a subset of the code necessary to do volume control in Windows according to what actually shipped. Previous teams that existed previously in time were effectively delegated to for parts of the product that still ship today because it just continues as you ship the same code. So this is the most generous interpretation of that org chart, that we have a volume team that's actually comprised of three temporarily distinct teams, right? So the reason we have at least four volume control, visual volume controls in Windows is because of this, right? There are four actual teams working on it what we actually might say is it probably looks more like this, which is to say you would have to go backwards in time to actually communicate with the Win7 team or the original team. So really, it's infinitely expensive. These links almost don't really exist. So you would expect them to be completely separate and have no way of really playing nice with each other or doing anything like that because the only choice for this team is basically to uh, obey whatever these teams feed forward, right? If that makes sense. So that's one reason I think Conway's law is almost underselling itself when it says, oh, uh, the org chart produces a copy of itself. Really, it's the entire temporal integration of the org chart that copies itself. So it's this, it's this four-dimensional org chart that's replicating itself in the software today because the cost for just reshipping all the old software is very low. So anytime someone doesn't have enough people to actually solve the whole problem, they just leave all the old stuff in place so that they only have to just solve the new problem, right? And you just end up with this org chart propagation. Now, there's another problem, which is that programmers now think delegation is a separate good. This is something that Conway probably would not have expected uh, necessarily in software, but he actually did predict it uh, in terms of management. So I guess I would say uh, probably somewhere along the line, Conway would have known this. If he didn't know it when he wrote the paper, he would have said, ah, it looks like this is happening inside software as well. So what I mean by that is, what is this? This is a class diagram of just the LLVM operator class. So like when you want to add two numbers together or shift left or something in C, right? It's just the operator class. Just the operator class. I'm going to keep saying that because this is just the operator class. There's no code here. 
This is just boilerplate that people have to deal with and write down to basically specify like, oh, the operator, you know, goes to conditional operator, has a shift left operator, right? It's just code organization inside the code that does not specify anything about how the program runs. It's just there as something that programmers added to artificially constrain the way the program works. That's what an inheritance hierarchy is. It's an artificial constraint on how your program is going to work. Now, if you turn this around, right, if you turn it 90 degrees, it's an org chart. So modern day programming practices have actually now grown to effectively be org charts inside org charts. There's an actual org chart which will replicate itself onto the product that is the organization of the humans that made it. Then there's an additional org chart that programmers invent for no reason other than they are unable to keep the entire complexity of the problem in their head. So they invent artificial breakdowns of problems that have nothing to do with the design process because the optimal design process would allow all of this to be fluid to find what design was best for the product as it goes. They artificially fix and create increased cost to that change by creating one of these for no reason other than mentally trying to grapple with the problem. Now, unfortunately, they don't really recognize that they're doing this because they've been taught that this is good. This is a good thing to do. It's actually not a good thing to do. It's a bad thing to do for the code. The reason that it ever got a reputation for being good is because it is a way of breaking down problems to make them more manageable. So it may have been a necessity for a problem too large for the person trying to tackle it, right? But it was exactly what an org chart is in the real world. It's something we do because we had to, not something that's actually good. This is a sign that you're underachieving, not that you're doing a good job. You may still have to do it because we can't figure out how to do it any better given the human brain being what it is, but it shouldn't be cause for celebration, right? Now Conway, because this paper is amazing, basically predicted all of this just more to do with management than software. But he either was thinking about software or would probably soon think about software as also having these traits as he saw things happen like object-oriented programming coming along. And so one of the things he says is if a designer is faced with a problem that is too complex for the designer to solve, what they will generally try to do is artificially break it up into smaller problems, right? And oftentimes they will do this without the necessary information about where those should happen, right? Because by definition, the person doesn't understand the problem that well, so they're not necessarily able to figure out, oh, the end design should look something like this, so I can break the teams into these pieces to tackle these problems separately, and I won't incur any design costs because I already know that the end design should be optimally looking like that. So that's how you get these kinds of programming things happening and these kinds of uh, situations where code bases seem to be divided in ways that doesn't actually make them very easy to work with because, hey, they probably were not originally divided into that way by someone who actually knew what a good, efficient end solution was because in order to start the process of programming, they had to make decisions about dividing things and in so doing, they eliminated possibilities of the design, design space. Now, Things are only getting worse, unfortunately. Libraries, engines, package managers, containers, virtual machines, microservices, all of these things are ways of introducing more org charts, right? More boundaries between things that cannot be optimized across because the people cannot communicate with each other rapidly or at all. And again, when people say that any of this is good, it's very important to recognize it is not good, right? Objectively speaking for the end product, these are all bad because every single one of these implies that we are under optimizing our eventual product because we have a priori decided what we will not consider to work together and to optimize together and to merge, right? We may need to do all of these things we simply might not have the brain capacity as humans or be able to form the kinds of communication structures that we need to until we have the Elon Musk brain implant, right, to do away with them. 
So we, we may be stuck with this, but it's crucial to always keep our eye on the fact that it's not good that we do that. People think these are good, they're all bad, right? But we have to do them right now because we haven't figured out how to do it better. And it's crucial to keep that in mind because we might be able to do better so we should always be on the lookout of ways we can stop doing some of these or doing them less because we would lead to more optimal products. Better design, more efficiency. Now, finally, Conway even predicted all of those things, right? He talks about the fact that managers, when faced with a thing to do, if they have the choice of trying something new and possibly it failing, or going with some old thing that they know will not be as good of a fit for what they're doing, but at least it's known quantity, they'll go with the known quantity. Why? Because no one ever got fired for mitigating risk, right? So in terms of your success as a programmer or your success as a manager of a career, unless you want to be a trailblazer, right, and you're like, I'm going to blaze new, I'm going to forge new paths, of course you're going to do things like, yeah, yeah, I install as many package managers as I can and use tons of libraries. Why? Because I know those things at least work because everyone's using them. So I know I'll only be as bad as everyone else is, right? Not somehow worse because I failed to do my new thing that would be more optimal or better, right? You're not taking that risk. You're letting someone else take that risk because that's the safe choice. So in conclusion, um, I, I would leave you with what with what Melvin Conway actually wrote. He basically said that, look, if we care about doing a good job and we're trying to push our design ability forward, then what we need to do is understand that we must be as lean and as flexible as possible. And as hopefully I've given you some indication of, if you study this kind of thing, you will realize that that goes for the org chart and the code base. So both our actual communication restrictions that we have because we are humans who have to talk to each other, and also the things we do in code that restrict its ability to be optimized together, such as encapsulation or using a library, those sorts of things, normally considered good, actually they are all costs that lead to worse designs if we somehow magically could get past them. Maybe our brains can't, but if we could, it would be better. Conway's law tells us so, and I think it's really true. And unfortunately, those two things, lean and flexible, are like the opposite of what almost anyone's doing now. 40,000 person orgs using hundreds of thousands of different components and libraries and Docker containers inside virtual machines running on top of hypervisor, like... We're the opposite of lean and flexible. We are as fat and unflexible as you could possibly imagine. And it's kind of unfortunate, and I think Conway's law kind of gives us a lens to see why we shouldn't be happy about that. Maybe we're struggling to do better and can't, but we should be struggling to do better and can't, not thinking that we're doing good, because Conway's law kind of tells us that we aren't. And so in closing, I guess I would say, all the thanks go to Mr. Melvin Conway for what is arguably the best software architecture paper I've ever read, and in fact, is just seems to be true about architecture in general, software or anything else. And I'm, I'm sorry on behalf of all of us working today that even though you warned us and gave us a lens through which to understand what we were doing wrong, we still have sort of ended up in your nightmare scenario where all of those problems that you talked about are not only as bad as they were when you talked about them, but they are ten hundreds, thousands of times worse because we're really not doing a lot of work to try and get past them. <laughs>